Mormonism. It's been a while, but I can think of no one better to ask than my favorite Salt Lake City guy, Aaron Shafawalaf. What up, Aaron? How you doing? It's good to be with you guys. Yo, doing well. how you doing? So, Aaron, you came to Phoenix a few years ago. Tell people what you did, what you thought, how Phoenix was to you when you came down. It was pretty amazing to be at the Sound and Pound conference. And that weekend, you guys had the front lawn wrapping going on in a booth. And all these people flooded the streets. And we got to do some evangelism there. And we even took a trip to the local mosque. I had a great time. Yeah, man. And, um, you know, I like being around you. You know, you're a thinker, but you're also practical. You get out there and share the gospel. And um, whether it's Mormons or Muslims, you have a heart for the lost and a, a good way to communicate it. So keep it on out. Uh, tell people briefly about what I did with you when we came out, because you do it all the time, you know, is what I'm getting at. Uh, when I came out to Salt Lake City, what about what goes on there that you're part of on a regular basis? Typically on Thursday nights, we're at the North Gate of Temple Square about 7 to maybe 10, 1030. And about a dozen Christians show up from about five or six different churches, and we do street evangelism, mostly conversational, hand out tracks, start conversations. There's uh, a ton of people there who are LDS uh, temple going, um, people who are maybe just coming to do a baptism for the dead or some other ordinances, or maybe they're just strolling around Temple Square. But we also have a ton of people there for business conventions. It's a cultural epicenter. People are tourists. Uh, certain seasons, they're going to ski. So it is pretty stinking awesome. We get to come share our faith and talk to all kinds of different people. And there's a really sweet unity between Christians of different churches who are sharing the same basic gospel message. Yeah, I've been there. I've seen that. And don't forget the shopping. Uh, big mall that the LDS Church purchased, right? Right across from the street. So people come out with these fancy handbags, I mean, and then like, they cross the street and go to the temple. I mean, like uh, you know, Nordstrom's. I mean, those kind of like just regular, or is there a Mormonified uh, version of those kind of stores? Well, they got over there, and you've been in there? There's a Deseret book right across the street from the South Gate, which is where I think we were. When, when you were with us. But yeah, the, the LDS Church built a huge mall and it's got Cheesecake Factory and what Apple. About, is the Deseret Book, is that a Mormon bookstore? Okay, Very Mormon bookstore. What about coffee? Uh, you can buy beer and coffee and all sorts of right? Mormon things Wait. in the, not in Deseret Book, but in right, the mall. Right across the street from the temple? Yeah. Wow. Uh, it's, but all, you, it's all about the money, guys. <laughs> you couldn't walk across the street with that stuff, could you, and go into the temple square, or could you? Um, I think it just depends on how eager the security guards are. I mean, right. With coffee, you totally could. Huh. Okay, um, that's just interesting. Should, anyway. All right, well, check this out. We're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to play a clip from a song because this is going to lead us into the topic of today's show. We're going to be talking about Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, and his first vision. And this is a rap song called Restoration, and Dude talks about it in his first verse. Check it out. Do say I'm dying enough. Yeah, I'm going to just do it like Shia LaBeouf. I'm going straight up, baby, to the man that I trust. Because I know what's real, so I'm going with Gus. And my homie just basic, no Einstein. Yeah, he never had a playlist or a timeline. And he just like us, no limelight. Until they both came down from the skyline. James the Mormon, obviously an LDS rapper, Restoration featuring Jay Warren. Kind of smooth, I have to admit. It's by far <laughs> the best Mormon rap I've ever heard, which actually leads me to the topic. I got of, drawn in. I was like, well, wait yeah, a second. Wait. There you go. <laughs> Next week's show, guys, is going to be on minorities and Mormon and Mormon hip-hop. That is what we're going to talk about next week, wow. straight up with Chris Miller. So, yo, Aaron, what is dude explaining there, and how significant is it uh, to Mormonism? Walk us through a little bit, can ya? So there, there's a story told in Mormonism that in 1820, Joseph Smith, very young teenager, doesn't know which of the uh, competing denominations is true, doesn't know which church is true. So, yeah, he uh, he reads James 1, James 1, 5, which says if we ask God for wisdom, he'll liberally give it to us. So he goes into the woods and asks God, you know, what should I do? Which of these churches is true? And, and then um, according to the way the story goes today, Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ uh, in bodily form descend in, in light and tell him all the churches are wrong, all their creeds are an abomination, all their professors are corrupt, that he should join none of them. Um, and that... Uh, that's very special to Mormons because for them, it, it means two things. One, it means that you can ask God directly for uh, an answer to a question and that you can have a revel revelatory answer that's very direct. And secondly, it means that Heavenly Father is an exalted human being 
who has a body of flesh and bones, who's essentially the same species as us in a different stage of development. All right. So the, have you guys heard much about this? First well, yeah, vision? I've heard that. So then that second point, Aaron, that, that of course fits in with Mormon doctrine on the doctrine of God, right? That in fact, of the same species, just a more evolved form. I mean, that fits right in with la- later teachings that came from the hand of Joseph Smith. Right. And to be clear, this is a very late version of the first vision. Uh, it's a very late account of the first vision. This is the, this, the, the version that LDS people know and read in their quads, in their scriptures, was written in 1838. This is evidently 18 years after the fact. And early Mormonism, early 1830s and 1820s, it's very monotheistic. I would even say modalistic. They believed the Father and the Son were one God. Um, they were confused about whether they were two persons or not. Um, so usually in conversation, this is how this works out for me. I, I might say something like, well, uh, early Mormonism didn't teach that Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ were separate beings. Uh, in fact, the Book of Mormon teaches that there's only one God. Um, and then I will often get the response, that's not true. In the first division, we're told that both Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ appeared to Joseph Smith, and this proves they're separate beings. And my response, uh, it's a couple things. One is, well, you're thinking about a very late edition, an account of the first vision. The earlier uh, account that's really notable, the 1832 account that Joseph Smith wrote in his own handwriting, his own journal, uh, only speaks of Jesus Christ visiting. Um, and in the lectures on faith, which used to be a part of Mormon scripture, the son is described as being the son because he's a personage of tabernacle, that he has flesh. And that the father is described as being a personage of spirit, not a personage of tabernacle or flesh. And that they're the same God and they uh, share the same mind. So So, are you suggesting that someone changed the version to add Heavenly Father along with Jesus, the two two distinct uh, human personages on that that, uh, latter revision? Are you suggesting somebody did that to conform to uh, Mormon teaching? Yeah, the short story is I think Joseph Smith had a very high view of angels where he thought they were um, essentially the same species as God and man. He evolved toward that. In the late 1830s, he had, he was under a lot of scrutiny again. And whenever he would undergo a lot of scrutiny, he would sub- suddenly become more elaborate, more fantastic with his storytelling. That's always a way to go, right? <laughs> You know, Aaron, though, the, the first ver- the version, you said where it was like two beings sharing one mind. Is that how you described it? That's the Lectures on Faith, Lecture 3. It, it, Ramon. If you've ever heard the phrase, sorry, Doctrine and Covenants. Yeah, The DNC. doctrine consisted of doctrinal lectures um, about the nature of God and other things that were actually removed from the LDS canon in the 1920s. Sorry. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of a superhero uh, a little bit from DC. Which one? You got like two characters who share a mind. Fire, oh, Firestorm, yeah, of course. Yeah, Firestorm. <laughs> I figured you know what I was talking about. Wow, that's a, that is, you pulled for that one. Wow. I did, I did. I, I'm impressed. <laughs> I was waiting. Yeah, but <laughs> pulled out of nowhere. Yeah, just, right about that. just to back up Aaron's point, I got <laughs> With some no quotes. Meaning either. <laughs> I got some quotes from uh, LDS general authorities that um, actually are kind of give conflicting versions, but they do have this emphasis on angels. Here's Brigham Young, what he said, quote, the Lord did not come with the armies of heaven, but he did send his angel to this same obscure person, Joseph Smith Jr., and informed him that he should not join any of the religious sects of the day, for they were all wrong. By the way, just let me stop there for a second. Modern-day Mormonism, generally speaking, is like, hey, we're all the same, it's kind of different, come join us, how dare you say we're not Christian? But look at what Brigham Young is saying that the first vision is about. All the, the first vision account, as, as it's read in Scripture today, says all their creeds are an abomination, and all the professors are corrupt, and all the churches are wrong. Hmm. I think the Mormons are very squeamish about that. They today, are, and, and they have a hard time owning it. They do because um, when they kind of get sad that we're witnessing to them outside the outside the temple here in Mesa, they'll say this is offensive. It's like you're saying we're wrong, but. It, and I'll say, well, what if I said to you that all your creeds were an abomination and everyone that professed Mormonism was corrupt? What would you say? They're like, that'd be horrible and really rude. I'm like, well, that's exactly what Joseph Smith said about all the Christian Protestant denominations of his day. And they'll say, huh? Well, maybe he just meant the corrupt churches in the area at that time. You know, it gets kind of localized like that. Mm. Uh, John Taylor also said this, quote, 
How did this state of things called Mormonism originate? We read that an angel came down and revealed himself to Joseph Smith and manifested into him in vision the true position of the world in a religious point of view. None of them was right, just as it was when the prophet Joseph asked the angel which, which of the sects was right that he might join in it. The answer was that none of them are right. What? None of them. No. <laughs> this guy. Okay, so check this out. What is the point then of the first vision? Like, how does it function in Mormonism? Why is it so essential to it? Because the name of that song we just played was called Restoration. Can you explain that to someone unfamiliar with Mormonism, how important this concept of restoration is, Aaron? So the modern version of Mormonism says that uh, in the first and second and third century, Mormonism lost, I'm sorry, uh, early Christianity lost uh, priesthood authority. We lost basically good doctrine. Uh, it, the text of scripture was fundamentally corrupted. Leadership was corrupted. And what we really needed was a restoration of proper authority so that we could rightly baptize, rightly give laying on of hands, rightly receive remission of sins. Um, they call it priesthood authority. Uh, and that we would rightly be restored to a, a correct view of God, which for them is, you know, God is an exalted man. We, as man is, God once was, as God as man may be. That Heavenly Father has a body of flesh and bones. He, he, he is not, uh, is not spirit in the sense that he, he did not create everything material. Um, so for Mormons today, um, arguably more important to Mormons than the nature of God is priesthood authority in their own worldview. In fact, Doctrine and Covenants 84, 21, 22 says this. It basically says the priesthood has to be in place in order for um, you to see God. Here's the quote. And without the ordinances thereof and the authority of the priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifest unto men in the flesh. For while, without this, no man can see the face of God, even the Father, and live. Now, Aaron, that begs an obvious question. Do you know what I'm getting at? How could Joseph Smith see God the Father? Yes. Yeah, I think I think the response I've heard to that is there's a qualification there. Right. No one can see it without being perhaps clothed in a priesthood power. Um, and Joseph Smith was protected. Um, what's really interesting about theophanies in the Old Testament is you know, Moses sees the receding glory of God or you get this, you know, I, Stephen in the New Testament sees Jesus standing, I think it says at the right hand of the power of God. Uh, it's, it's, there's not a lot of, um, it, it's really interesting. The Bible doesn't go into great detail about what God looks like when right. there's some sort of theophany, because the big idea that the New Testament makes very clear is that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. John 1 says that no one has seen God at any time. Only uh, you know, Jesus is from above, we're from below. Um, if, if God wants to show up in a body, in theory, then he created that body. Um, he's, not, he's not fundamentally that. Uh, the spirit can descend as a dove. That doesn't mean the spirit is a dove. So this is a, kind of a technical point, but Mormonism sees the Father and Jesus Christ appearing to Joseph Smith in bodily fashion as proof the Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ are separate beings and both of the human species. But I don't think that makes that point very conclusively because uh, in Christian theology, we've always had a place for theophanies. And um, I, I think there's a widespread Mormon uh, misunderstanding of the Trinity. They confuse it with modalism. Yeah. Uh, this is a common correction I have to make. I have to, Well, what I believe is that God the Father and Jesus Christ are two distinct, different persons in relationship. One prays to the other, one loves the other, one sins the other, and they are so tied together. They actually share the same essence, the same being. They are the same God. They never had to meet and form a relationship or initiate a connection. They've always been one God. And that goes a long way. with I, I, it, That's a really non-confrontational way just to maybe have a doctrinal discussion with Mormon neighbors is to, is to just address these mi basic misunderstandings because they really do think that what we believe typically is modalism, that Heavenly Father and Jesus are one person. Do you um, do you find, as you point out, things um, like what the Bible really says about uh, theophanies, and I'm, I'm sure there's others as well, um, the people, how do people reconcile that typically, the Mormons that you talk to? Um, clearly, this is different. Uh, I mean, really, what you're doing there is biblical theology. Like, here's, here's what actually happens in the Bible, right, when uh, we encounter the Lord. Um, here's what the Bible says uh, about Jesus, right? And uh, I'm just curious in terms of, uh, as you're sort of essentially doing good biblical theology, uh, with Mormons, how, how do they um, how do they interact with you on that? Well, I, I can tell you one of the big responses I get. Um, the New Testament says, I think it's in First Timothy, Paul says that God is immortal, invisible, the only true God. And we already mentioned that 
Colossians 1 says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And John 1 says no one can see, no one has seen God at any time. The way, what I've heard in response to that is that the invisibility of the Father, it's not about his nature, it's just about his location. So it's, it's the same sense in which you, Vermont, right now are invisible to me, that you're simply not in the room and I have no sight of you. So Mormons will say that um, th- th- those, those of some sophistication who've read the literature anyway right. will say, well, Heavenly Father is invisible in the sense that we just simply can't see him now. It's not that he's not seeable. It's not that he's not the kind of being that you, can, you can't you know, see. Right, okay. That seems like a category error. This is a category mistake uh, where because you're talk, you're, now you're talking about something, something not present. But that's different than saying ontologically invisible. But the Bible's talking about an ontology what is the nature of God as being invisible, but they're switching right. it to having to do with proximate location in essence, as in present. One thing that's great about this topic is you can go pretty far without arguing. A, a lot of LDS people just simply hasn't, haven't seen the evidence. And so just presenting, hey, can I show you for a few verses from the New Testament that talk about the invisibility right. of God? Right. A lot of them haven't thought about or been exposed to the evidence. And, and secondly, there's a pastoral concern here a lot of LDS people think that if God isn't essentially of the human species, then he can't be personally relatable, that he can't love me in a personal way. So one of the things I try to do is kind of fill in that gap by talking about how God has demonstrated his personal and intimate love in a way that doesn't require him to be um, fundamentally the human species. There's two things there. One is God, El Shaddai, the God who loved Abraham and Isaac, he loved them. He did not um, have to be buddy buddies with them, uh, peers of the same species to, to do that. He, he showed his condescending love for his people, for his creation. He's committed to his creation. He's Preach it, brother. His <laughs> the other thing, it? too, is that the, the incarnation, Christmas, is very special to me in Utah in a way that other people perhaps don't realize. Um, Christmas is about God becoming a man. The, the, the miracle of Christmas is that the omnipotent God out of love, became a weak little crying uh, baby. Hmm. And this, this great omniscient God became a little learner who's probably homeschooled by you know, mom and dad, <laughs> Mary and Joseph. And that, the reason that's incredible for Christians is that God's not fundamentally a man. So that God would add a human nature to himself makes Christmas all the more amazing. And so it really begs the question for Mormonism, how, what kind of theology can Mormonism give us uh, regarding the incarnation of Jesus, of God becoming a man. And, and embarrassing, it's very embarrassing for Mormon theology that Mormon leaders, when they've thought about this, have t- talked of Heavenly Father uh, descending to earth in bodily fashion and uh, associating with Mary in the capacity of husband and wife, uh, impregnating her, um, and then Jesus being a kind of demigod with half mortal DNA and half immortal DNA and now he's suddenly with superhuman demigod powers able to suffer infinite psychophysiological pain in the Garden of Gethsemane. But for me, it's no— That was an awesome God, phrase, God by the way. <laughs> genuine human being, and he suffered genuinely on the cross, and that was a sufficient sacrifice for my sins. Little, little baby born in the manger, free from the sin and free from the anger, came to save us, came to raise us, God is with us, name is Jesus, in the flesh now, incarnated, pre-existent, not created, Mike 5.2, said in Bethlehem, I am's plan to become a man, and infinity becomes a finite, invisible, inside your eyesight, transcendent, step in the timeline, how could a child be God in divine nine, I'm stargazing, it's a mystery, nativity, all of history, virgin born in an instant, when the king became an infant, so vocab rap right there. Good. <laughs> well, let's see. I guess my question is this, Aaron. We, we, vocab mentioned it earlier. There's been a change over the last, whether it's 10 years or 30 years, between, uh, you know, if you will, uh, uh, common Mormons understanding that it was a different religion and telling you that. I, I can remember that in my college days where that was their posture, where now it seems to be, hey, we're just a different denomination and believe pretty much the same thing. How has that changed? It seems as I'm listening to you in the way that you approach them evangelistically, that you are getting down to to real truth issues and and uh, logical errors and, and differences with the Bible. Um, is that harder to do today because uh, they 
they have sort of a uh, soft pedal view that these differences aren't that uh, serious and you're making a, a mountain out of a molehill or, or how has that changed in evangelism? My evangelism's changed those past three or four years. Sell out. And, Just kidding. <laughs> in the way I didn't, <laughs> in the way I haven't anticipated. And it's that simply I tend to treat Mormons that I meet on the street as agnostics in embryo. Yep. And I and I, I can't assume that they actually have a foundational belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ or the existence of God, even though they say they do. And I'm not trying to be malicious or um, say they're slandering or being you know, liars. I'm just what I try to do is is get to some really basic issues. So they just I, they just don't know. That's what you're saying. They just have never thought about it. Uh, they've never imagined imagined what it would be like to be a believer in Jesus Christ outside of Mormonism. And so once their testimony of Joseph Smith, once they're dis, is gone, once they're disillusioned with the LDS church, they have usually nothing left over in terms of a solid belief in God and the resurrection of Jesus or the reliability of the Bible. Yeah, and a so lot of the, the non... I try to plant seeds that would that would plan for their exit, basically. A lot of the non-missionary ones are a lot more skeptical than you might think, too. Yeah. A lot, I mean, S- relativistic. S- skeptical of their theology? Uh, kind of. It's like, well, who knows? So it's just a Maybe. cultural thing, then, basically, is what's happening. I mean, this is, I mean, I don't know what Aaron would say, but uh, I mean, obviously, Aaron's probably inter- interacting with a broader uh, base than, than we are, but that's what I see, at least. That's why agnostic is an embryo makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, that's a, that's a very helpful category to think about. So, Aaron, we've only got a minute or so left. If you if a Mormon's listening and they're like, okay, well, here you are, what do you want to tell them in 40 seconds about the first vision and what they should really know? I would go to LDS.org and search for the Gospel Topic Essays and read the LDS Church's own essay, uh, Gospel Topic Essay, on the first vision and get a, a gentle introduction to some really sensitive topics. And then I would just beg my LDS neighbors to give Jesus a second chance to read one of the four Gospels as a child when things come crashing down. That sounds good. And just to show you how much confusion there is about this, there's even a new book by a Mormon author called The First Vision, a harmonization of 10 accounts from the sacred grove. Matthew B. Christensen trying to harmonize it because they don't even go together. That's what happens when it's man's word, not God's peace.